Hi, everybody. How are you? Thanks for coming on this gorgeous, warm summer night. Um, I wasn't going to stand up here and have this sort of format, but I guess they're going to film it so other people can watch um, whatever the questions may come up and what the answers may be or not be. So um, thanks for coming. I'm Heather Summers. I'm your state senator uh, from the 18th district. And I'm here not to lecture you, but to, or not to like give you my version of what's going on, but for you to ask questions. And hopefully I'll be able to answer any of the questions that you have. And it's just an open forum. Feel free to ask anything. Hopefully I'll be able to answer it. If I can't, I will let you know that I don't have the answers and I will get back to you. Um, I thought I could start by giving you some of the highlights of some of the legislation that I was able to pass in this past session. Um, we were able to do quite a few things to move the needle in um, my opinion in the right direction. I sat or had the um, privilege of sitting on five committees. I was the chair or vice chair um, of those committees and I also sat on appropriations and I think I'm going to just put this here if I can. So um, I acted as the chair of public health which um, for me, uh, fits with my background, but I had no really idea on how voluminous the bills were that came through public health. We had close to 400 bills come through. So they go through a screening process, uh, which is what the committee wants to hear and have a public hearing on. So we heard um, testimony and had public hearings on everything from an eye care bill, um, opiates to legalization of marijuana to um, being able to um, go into a particular license of a doctor and preclude them from doing very specific things. We heard uh, testimony on the consolidation of health districts, so there was this wide variety of uh, bills that we heard. Uh, we have a bipartisan committee. And most of the bills that came out of the committee were unanimous, and we really worked well together, regardless of your party, uh, to come up with the best bills that we thought um, could really impact um, public health. Some of them in particular is we absolutely deny the consolidation of the health districts. That would have been a terrible bill for um, our particular region. It would have cost a lot more money, and it would have really taken local control and put it in the state's hands. And, for me, the more control at the local level, the better. Um, so that was um, a big hurdle to overcome. We also passed some really um, strong opiate legislation, which I've been a champion of, which does some very particular things. It talks about insurance covering the cost of um, detox. Right now, the, um, they deny people that are trying to get help. So that was one of the things that is required. We also looked at. Um, doctor's ab ability to prescribe opiates for a long period of time and reduce that, especially with, um, with young folks. Um, we set up a 24-hour portal on the public health website that we will be um, hopefully unveiling by next year, which will have an active uh, real-time bed availability. People that are trying to seek treatment, uh, physicians can spend hours on the phone trying to find where a bed is available for them. Uh, this would be active and in real time, so they could just look on their cell phone or their smartphone or the public health website and they would know exactly what beds are available. Um, it also required all opiate uh, prescriptions to be done electronically. Right now, um, that will help with tracking of the prescriptions that are written and monitored. However, if a physician um, is not capable of writing them electronically because we have a lot of um, advanced age physicians that are not going to invest in a um, computer system that will talk to the pharmacies. They still have a waiver where they would be able to write the script, but it's on this special paper now. So it's not easy for somebody to steal a script pad and write their own, um, their own uh, prescription for opiates. We also focused on education and we focused on first responders right now um, are required to carry Narcon, and every first responder, according to the law, has to have it. It's very expensive, it has an expiration. So one of the things that we changed was that um, at least one first responder on a, a call has to have it, but not everybody does. We also made Narcan available so that anyone can go into a pharmacy and request it, and they will be given it. Um, you don't have to have a prescription for it. It's called a standing order. So um, previously, we had something where if I had an opiate problem, I could go in and request the Narcan, and the pharmacist is able to write me a script for it. But right now, if my daughter 
needed it, I couldn't get it for her. We've changed that law so that now a parent or somebody who's caring maybe for an elderly um, adult that is taking pain medicine that they're concerned about can get that easily and um, they don't have to go through the process of um, getting a full script, going to a doctor, just making it easier. So those are the highlights of that opiate bill. We also worked on a great brownfield bill, which will um, actually provide low interest loans for those investors that are interested in revitalizing brownfields. Um, that was actually my coup of the, um, of the, I'll say of the Senate. At four minutes till midnight, I was asked by um, a Democrat senator and a Republican senator who had been there for probably between them 40 years. They said, Heather, can you help me get this bill called? And you know, I'm just this freshman going, sure, I love this bill. It's a great bill. It'll, it's good for our, our region. It's great for uh, the Preston site that's going to be revitalized. And um, we managed to get the bill called and voted on literally like one minute before midnight when the session ends. So um, I took that as a compliment that the girl from Groton is rattling the sword to get the bill called that needs to get called. Um, so there's a l many more bills. We did a great consumer eye care bill. I see we have a someone here with me that worked very hard on that bill with us. Um, and what we did is we passed legislation because there are companies now out um, touting really eye exams online that you take with your cell phone. So you literally um, would hold it up to your eye, maybe take a picture, go through a few things, and um, you can have it reviewed by a either an optometrist or an ophthalmologist someplace somewhere else who's going to sign off on your script that you've taken now with your cell phone and um, they want to sell you eyeglasses and contacts. So we had a real safety concern with that because contacts are actually contacting your cornea, big source of infection. Number one reason you go to the to the doctor is because of a problem with contacts. And we thought it was very important that the first time that you get a prescription, you actually see a physician. And the reason for that is there are so many other things that a physician can see in the eye when he's doing an eye exam. And this eye potential, or whatever they call it, eye exam, which is not really an eye exam on your cell phone, is not cleared by the FDA. It's not approved, and we felt it was really a consumer issue and uh, a safety issue. So we did, um, and it was not easy. We had a lot of pushback from the contact lens corporations that are selling contact lenses, and um, we were called anti-business, this, then the other thing, and I reminded them that 1-800-CONTACTS is in Utah and Simply Contacts is in New Jersey. Um, we want to help the people in Connecticut have their eyes be safe. Um, we, we heard testimony from physicians that had talked about um, how they had discovered brain tumors by looking through the eye. It's the only place that you can actually see the vessels. And so um, we all felt very strongly about that in um, public health. So we were able to pass legislation which says the first time you go, you have to see a physician to get your eyes examined. They will write the script. Um, the second time you come back, you have to see a physician. They will make sure that it's working, and after that, you can do what you want. You're allowed to get your eyeglasses and your contacts from anyone you want, but you really need to see a doctor, just like you would have to go see a doctor for your heart or for your feet or anything else. So that's something that, to me, would seem, would not take so long or be so difficult to get past when you had this whole committee that was in favor of it, but it was really quite something. So I'm happy to say it passed and the governor has signed that bill. Um, in some of the other committees, um, we in education, we passed a mandate relief bill that had been worked on for seven years. We were able to finally get that through. Um, I sit as the vice chair of education and the vice chair of higher education. We were able to enact an apprenticeship program in higher ed. Um, they looked at separating the VOTEC schools from the standard board of education, state board of education, I voted against that. I think they should be together and I didn't want another layer of government, but it passed to separate them. Um, the mandate bill will help superintendents do things like, for example, um, there is a requirement before this bill, if you had a, uh, let's say a student that um, had special needs and might have to be restrained because of behavior, um, it was required that every single person be trained in this special restraint. 
Um, whereas we thought it made more sense to train the people that are actually going to be restraining or have contact with this particular child or may have contact rather than every single person being um, trained, which has to be reviewed every two, two years. It's a huge cost to the um, local municipalities. So things that made common sense. We also gave the local schools the ability to start their school year when they choose, not when someone else chooses. There's a big push in this area to start school after Labor Day because um, when we do that, we have another week and a half of potential tourism coming here, um, of families going on vacation here. And when you start school before that, you know, the whole week before in August is used up buying your supplies and getting your new shoes and getting your hair cut so you're ready to go back to school. So we gave local school districts the ability to choose on their own when they wanted to start their school. So. Um, I could go on and on about other bills, but these are some of the things that we did, and we, even though we only moved the needle a little bit, we were able to move it. Uh, we were also able to stop a lot of what I considered very bad legislation. Um, there was bills in there. I called it the devil's bill. It was Bill 6666, and um, it was a workman's comp bill, which would have increased the cost of workman's comp by at least another 5%. We would have been the highest workman's comp anywhere in the United States. And it gave um, someone the ability to go back with no statute of limitations to file a workman's comp claim. So you could have worked at Electric Boat 25 years ago and come back 25 years later and say, I hurt my back, and here's the claim. So it was great for the lawyers, terrible for employers, and really unfair if you look at it for everyone who's going to be having to pay into the workman's comp. So we were able to stop that. Um, we were. I shouldn't say this, but maybe able to stop the, the um, vote on the legalization of marijuana. Um, that could be something that we might see trying to be shoved into the implementer. Um, that, that idea or that concept was heard in judiciary and it was also heard in public health. And coming from a public health perspective, the public health committee was very much against that. Um, the judiciary committee um, couldn't get a vote on it. I know that there's many people that are interested in it for the revenue portion of it. Um, but when you look at other states and the revenue that's generated versus the problems that are created by the legalization of marijuana, it really makes you think and contemplate. Um, every physician that I know um, that testified, testified against the legalization. Um, and I think it's a difficult sell in the middle of an opiate crisis to be legalizing marijuana myself. But um, we'll have to see how that um, continues on. So. I wanted to just open this up. I'm sure everyone wants to talk about the budget. Um, and I am happy to answer all the questions that I can about the budget. Um, so it just let me start. Who would like to ask the first question or make a comment? You mentioned the brownfield. Yes. A brownfield site is a site that's contaminated. And what happens right now is we have a lot of brownfield sites. They could be old mills. They could be the Mystic Oral School is a brownfield site because of what's in um, either in the walls, in the building, or what's in, in the soil. And what happens right now is, if you have a developer that wants to go in, it's so costly to clean up the site. And then previously, uh, the Department of Environmental and Energy would never sign off that it's a clean site, so you can't get financing to build whatever you want to build. So this brownfield bill really helps take care of that. So you will be able, as a developer, to go in to clean up a site and then be able to get financing to build whatever it is that you want to build going forward. And there's a lot of great potential in reuse of brownfield sites, but one of the biggest um, adherent or de you know, deterrent is the cleanup and then being able to get the sign off that this is a clean site so a bank will lend you money to be able to um, move forward and redevelop that land. So this should really help. It's something that we tried to do previously, and we couldn't get it passed. It has not been signed yet by the governor, so I'm keeping my, it's 7229 is the bill. Um, I'm tr keeping my fingers crossed that he will sign it because it'll be good for economic development in the state of Connecticut, absolutely. It's not much different except the financing comes from other places, and brownfield sites, um, I'm not sure if, um, I think super funds are, from what I understand, um, multiple times a brownfield site. A brownfield is not quite as contaminated as a Superfund site. So you can, you know, in, in the designation, 
at the oral school, we're working with um, the DECD to, to get small grants and grant to try to clean up certain areas of that property so that it can be reused. Um, but it's very, very difficult to get a private investor to want to come in and you know clean up an old mill or you know remediate whatever it has to be in the land um, and then go ahead and do the development if they don't have financing or low interest loans to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we do, you know? We want to make it complicated, no. Anybody have any questions? Do you want to speak to the eye care bill? I want to thank you for your support, actually, and the other legislators, and just, um, it was good to see a bipartisan approach and unanimous approach to this bill, and I think um, it really, hopefully, um, you know, made a difference and just seeing the political system work was, was gratifying in that case. And any questions anyone has as far as that goes, mm -hmm. I'd be glad to help answer. But uh, it was a difficult struggle, wasn't it, to see big business really try to, you know, outside mm -hmm. the state of Connecticut, big business try to control something on, on uh, medical, you know, devices, procedures, and protocol, and trying to dictate what, what they thought was, was best on non-FDA approved procedures. It was very, very eye-opening, you know, yeah, to just to see the whole process. But again, thank you for your support. And, um, You're welcome. Um, it was just, uh, it was just an interesting, you know, process uh, yeah, to see everything unfold. So. Yes, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about this particular bill. It does not mean that you have to go to your doctor yes, every yeah. six months for your eye. So yeah. if if you are, have any questions, you can read the bill. But it really is a good bill for consumers, it protects them, it protects them from misleading uh, marketing, and uh, you can buy your contacts wherever you want, you can buy your glasses wherever you want. So the prescription just the way you get to your pharmacist, that's what you want, just mm -hmm. the whole procedure, so that it is, you know, examination done, medically approved, and you can go anywhere you want. Right. Order 1-800-whatever mm -hmm. in, in Utah if you want. We're not trying to stop that, we're trying to encourage cost savings in health care, but we're trying to make sure that it's just medically safe um, as far as that goes, and the protocol is followed. Um, so I'm right. a big believer in telemedicine. It's just not there yet. The technology is just not there as far as mm -hmm. ophthalmology, optometry, in terms of trying to do an eye exam through a cell phone. Yeah, I, I asked, one of the questions I asked was, what's the failure rate, or what's your success rate? And they kept saying, oh, well, we'll get you the data, but they never did, so right. that was like, yes, right. so. Um, Anyhow, I'm at, does anyone want to ask me anything else? Yes, sir. Tolls, well, personally, tolls for me are dead. They don't make financial sense. Um, they sound great um, in theory, but what um, is not really explained well is that, um, and, and this is what our, we were told, is that um, every state has its own um, negotiation or contract with the federal government on how they receive money from the federal government for highways. So we're not the same as Massachusetts, we're not the same as New Jersey, we're not the same as any other state. We have our individual deal, so to speak, with the federal government. So if Connecticut were to enact tolls, first of all, um, the governor and the commissioner of DOT are against tolls. Um, there would have to be a $4 million study done just to look at where to put the tolls, what the off, um, what the routes would be once somebody wants to avoid the toll, what kind of toll that does on the local roads. You would have to put a toll every four miles. And this is just not on 95. It's 95, 5, 9, 15, 84. You would have to charge five times the highest toll anywhere in the United States. And it would take you close to 20 years to get your money back. You also would have to pay back what you've received from the federal government since 1984. That's what we've been told. That's why it doesn't make sense. It sounds great to say, oh, we're going to have tolls, because Massachusetts has tolls, but we have a different deal than Massachusetts does. So financially, it doesn't make sense. Um, we still have to study it. We'd have to spend close to $4 million. If you go to the DOT website, you can see the first part of the study that they've done. And you can see um, they used to have a map of exactly where they thought the tolls would go. Um, and 
you know, I can't think of a worse idea doing it at the end, other end of the state. There is plenty of money that we generate. We just have to allocate it properly. And one of the things that we're doing in our budget to pay for transportation is to take all of the money that is generated from auto sales off of a lot and segregating that. So that money is enough to fully fund our transportation. The transportation fund has been rated over the years. We plan on not doing that. We don't have to raise any more taxes through tolls. We don't have to spend more money on tolls. We just have to allocate our resources properly. So that's where I am on tolls. I don't know. That must have been when the um, no. That must have been when the contract was was signed or something. I didn't ask that question, but that's a good one. Um, I'm still trying to locate and track down the actual contract between the state and the federal government. I have not been able to get that yet, but I'm still working on that because I actually want to read that. Um, so that's what we've been told. There's been a lot of talk about tolls. Um, I, you know, we heard that they were going to debate it in the House. They weren't going to debate it. Um, I don't think it ever got called, so they never had the conversation on tolls. Um, and there's been a lot of that this, this session. We're going to talk about things knowing we're not going to vote on it, and then we'll put it to the side. They call it PTing, which is, for me, um, something that I'm not used to. Um, I'm like, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. Let's vote on it. Let's not talk about it. And then for two hours, while everybody's watching, it gives this illusion of doing something, um, an illusion of busyness, and you know that you're not going to vote on it. And um, unfortunately, that happens. The, t the leaders agree to do that. So they say, OK, we're going to talk about this for two hours. We're not going to vote, but we just want to talk about it because we want our constituents to know that we talked about it. So that's something that I found very eye-opening. That and um, the, the time. I'm somebody that my time is very valuable, it's really organized. Um, I had a very hard time adjusting to waiting around for 14 hours before we do anything. You know, if, if somebody says the Senate's going to start at 10, I want to be there at quarter of 10 and start at 10. Uh, there was many times when the Senate was supposed to go in at 10 and we didn't go in until 6 o'clock at night. So, you know, if you have another job, which most of us do, it, it makes your, it difficult to get your job done and, you know, do you want to run over to the other office building? Will they call you? Um, so that is something that everyone tells me I have to get used to. I have not been able to get used to it yet. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, <laughs> no, I keep saying if I was in charge, we would start at 10, you know, but I'm not in charge. So um, that's something that is a difficult pill to swallow. That's probably my phone ringing. Um, so does anyone else have any questions specifically? Yes, yes ma'am. To mm -hmm. The budget. Yes. Where are we and including that question, mm -hmm. the debt bomb of the pensions? Well, I know that you came to my coffee hour and we are still putting together all the information that you wanted so that you can help spread the word. Um, the, the budget process right now is um, at a standstill, I will say. Um, we were possibly going to go in tomorrow, um, but we have been told that we will not be called, um, which means that they're the leaders. Right now, this budget really is out of our hands. We've had all the input. We put together a budget. I think that our Senate Republican Caucus has a fantastic budget. We spent a lot of time. We did a line item by line item budget. It's been vetted by the Office of Fiscal Analysis. Um, all of us had a lot of input. My areas were education and health. Each one of us had um, areas that we would provide input in. Um, we tried to have our budget be heard before the session was over, uh, but we were prevented. Um, my issue with the way things have progressed is you might not like our budget, but we have a budget. So let's put it out there. What you don't like, put an amendment, debate it, Give us another idea, but the uh, the idea that we're just pushing this off um, for me is unfounded. So, from what I've been told now, because we're out of the process, this is all in the leader's hands. Is that um, there are probably four corners where the budgets are in the four corners. So, um, there has not been the kind of progress that I would have hoped to see to come to some sort of um, compromise. So the process now is we potentially will be called in on the 24th 
um, of July, uh, but I don't know whether that will be to discuss the budget or if that will be to look at the bills that the governor has vetoed, whether we want to override those bills or not. Um, I'm hoping it's to talk about the budget. Um, I uh, will say that the I have not seen a full vetted line item by line item budget out of either the Democratic House or the Democratic Senate, um, nor I just received one out of the Republican House. So there are differences between the Senate Republicans and the House Republicans. We originally had a budget together, but then we separated after the last financials came in and they were um, less positive than expected. There are certain things that the House does that the Senate does not agree with. So we have separations there between the parties, and that's also true for the uh, Democrat House and the Democrat Senate, from what I've been told. I'm awfully sorry to hear that we continue to kick the can down the road, because right now, with the state of Connecticut, and as you know, the fiscal dysfunction that we are experiencing cannot be kicked down the road any longer. I agree with that. Um, unfortunately, for me, just being a member of the Senate, there's, again, it's the leaders that have to call everyone together. It's a special session now, so in order to have any bill go to the floor, it has to be signed off by the Speaker of the House, Joseph Arasimowitz, and Martin Looney, who is the Democrat Senate leader. Please so without you know, those. Whatever I can do coming from your office mm -hmm. to help get this resolved. I will. The best thing anyone can do is to call those two people and say, we want a budget to be heard, to debate it. We've waited long enough. That's our only job, I feel, as a legislator, is to come up with a budget. I actually um, presented in my Senate caucus, let's not do anything, any, any bills. We don't need to rename camps. We don't need to you know, do all these silly things. Um, we need to get a budget. Um, and unfortunately, nobody agreed with me. But that's our, that's our job, so. The debt bomb of the pension. What's happening there? Well, the, the the state employee pension and state employee salaries is 42 percent of our budget. Um, and as the demographics change, that will continue to rise. Um, so I just want to be clear that we have amazing state employees that have worked really hard for our state, and this problem that we have now or this large debt that we're facing is not just from Governor Malloy. This goes back from governor before and governor before. This has been 30 years in the making. But where we are now is we are a shrinking state. We are losing population in those that are under 30 and over 65. And so there's less and less of us here to foot the bill for this large um, ballooning payment going out further. To put it in perspective, the top 15 percent of the wage earners in Connecticut normally contribute about $600 million to the state coffers. Last year, that top 15 percent only contributed $250 million. What that means is those people that have the wherewithal or the wealth are leaving Connecticut. Um, so those top earners are either in Florida for six months and a day, or they've sold their house and they've moved on. We're losing 500 people a week in Connecticut to other states. And we're not just losing them to Texas or to Florida. We're losing them to Massachusetts. We're losing them to New York. We're losing them to our surrounding states. So that is a really um, strong indicator that Connecticut is, right now, not doing what it should be to, number one, attract people to stay here or making us um, have an environment in which those who are retired can afford to stay here. So those are things that are um, very much on the minds on how do you structurally change things so that we can become a viable state because we are literally one above Illinois and two above not even a state but a territory, Puerto Rico. We are very close to junk bond status. And um, we really are borrowing to pay for toilet paper. That's how bad the revenue situation is. And we can't tax ourselves out of it. We've looked at things like if we doubled the income tax, it still doesn't come near what we owe. So, 
and we actually have a governor now and um, a commissioner of, of tax, uh, I guess it's of revenue services, Kevin Sullivan, saying we realize now that we've had two of the largest tax increases in Connecticut history and the diminishing returns. We're losing people and we're getting less revenue than we were before. Um, so we, one of the things that um, highlights this, and it's, it's really simple, we're um, a shoreline community, so I think everyone can understand this. If you buy a boat in Connecticut, it can be a small sailboat. Most of the boats that are sold are $20,000 sailboats or power boats. You pay 6% tax on it. If you buy that same boat in Rhode Island, right across the border, you pay 3 So when you buy your boat in Rhode Island and pay 3%, you actually keep your boat there because they don't tax you on certain things. And then you get it fixed there and painted there. So we lose all of that to Rhode Island because we're not even on a level playing field. One of the things, there was a bill in this year, let's just have our boats be taxed as the same as Rhode Island so that we can compete because we lost 15,000 boat sales last year. And I, you know, there's this, this idea that everybody who has a boat, it's like a 400 foot mega yacht. Um, and in reality, most of the boats that are sold, like I said, are probably less than some people spend on cars or motorcycles or campers or whatever. So we've really, our policies haven't been such that we're paying attention to what's going on around us and we've really put ourselves in a very, very difficult position. So um, there are things that can be done structurally to try to put us on the right path, but it's gonna be years before we um, are able to, to really have a clear open highway to how Connecticut can um, return itself to what it could be. And it's not going to be easy because, like I said, this has been going on for 30 years or, or more. Um, but one of the things, too, is if we took all of the state employees and they had benefits that are equivalent to what you see on the municipal, the local municipal level, for the unions or the unions at some of our employers, we would be okay. We would not be in this position. But the contracts that have been allowed to go through over the years, and this is no fault of any state employee because you know, this was a great thing for them. And, and I understand that. Years ago, their salaries were lower and they had this great benefit package. But over time, the salaries have come way up and the benefit package has also not shrunken in any way, shape, or form. Um, just to put it in perspective, I'm on the state employee health care system now. Um, just, I had an emergency appendectomy in the middle of session, which was really inconvenient because I had all these bills that I needed passed, and I was, I'm not fine, I'm fine, and my husband finally made me go to the doctor, and um, I was in the hospital for a few days. My whole bill was $35. I pay 2%, I think, out of my salary. I, only, I make $28,000 a year. So I don't pay anything into that. You can't opt out of it either because once you're a state employee, that's, that's what you get. So I looked and did an analysis over the last summer and I brought it to my leaders and they at first said that can't be true and then it was vetted and looked at by the Office of Fiscal Analysis. And all it was, because I come from healthcare, was if we took all the state employees and we switched them from this plan, which I call, it's like a unicorn plan. It doesn't exist in the real world. No one else can buy into it. It's not offered anywhere. And we switched everyone to the platinum plan, the best plan that's available on the market that everyone would be dying to have. What do we save? Take a guess. $300 million in one year because you have a copay, you have a deductible, you are more in line with what you're seeing in the private sector or the local municipal unions. They all pay in, they all have deductibles or they have HSAs. Rita knows, she was the mayor, hi Rita. Um, so the teachers have that too. It's, it's so, if you just try to put it in this perspective of, you know, we're, you're taking this, this unit and you're just trying to get them in line with a local municipal union or a union at Electric Boat or a union at Hillary Corporation. I'm making it up. I don't know whether they're, you know, it is very different and we wouldn't be in this position and it would be manageable. Um, the other thing is 
The size of gov government has just grown exponentially in Connecticut. In the 1980s, um, one of the Senate staff was telling me we had 3.1 million people approximately in Connecticut, and we had 28,000 state employees. So here we are, years later. We have about the same population. It's shrinking, though. And we have over 50,000 state employees. So the size of our government has exploded also. So now you're having more people with a really luxurious benefit package that in some cases there's unlimited overtime so you're paying pension on this very large salary um, two things i can give you in our budget that we look at are uh, yukon health center which is a really large financial loser for the state um, you have physicians in there that are also part of this big benefit package and um, we said in our budget you need to go find a private partner to make it work. It's a very small facility. It doesn't have the capability of really placing our med students in their third and fourth year. And it's competing with, you know, Hartford Hospital and some of these larger institutions right around the corner. So they're gonna have to figure out a way to make that work uh, with a private sector partner, or that's not something that we can continue. Um, the, again, this very large benefit package creates very large overhead that particular um, organization does all the health care for our prison systems, which is extremely expensive. Our caucus said, we're going to competitively bid that this year so that we can provide the same health care, but we're going to competitively bid it and see what the market can do rather than have this huge overhead go in and do that type of work. So those are the types of things that we're trying to do in this budget. One of the things that we feel very strongly about in our caucus is if you are a commissioner, you can have one deputy commissioner, but you can't have 10, and you can't have seven, and they can't be political appointments that are all making very large amounts of money, and then again, in the pension system. So you can have a commissioner, a deputy commissioner, and one executive assistant, but you can't be top, you know, top heavy with overhead, because there's a lot of that, and we can save a lot of money when we do that, and it's really not necessary. Um, so those are the types of things we're trying to look at. Um, we're looking at what organizations can we combine so that we can be more efficient um, with um, less people being able to do that as people retire. Do we have to fill that position? Uh, but it's very difficult to do in a large, vast, bureaucratic um, organization, <laughs> to say the least. So um, it, has been, it has been a very difficult process. Our, our budget, um, one of the things that it does in particular is it um, changes the way that we fund education and it, we actually put more money into the pool of education. Um, the education formula, if there really were one, um, has been so politicized over the years that it doesn't represent the formula that it began with. It doesn't even look like it. You couldn't go back and try to figure out why does Groton get this? Why does West Hartford get that? It's, uh, it's really been a case of if you had strong representation and you were in the majority party, you tended to get more money for education. That's just been the way it works. So we wanted to level the playing field. And we came up with a formula for education um, that's based on the student, not the town. Well, a little bit on the town, but mostly on the student. So the money will travel with the student. And it starts with a base amount, and then it gives an additional 5% uh, if you are on free or reduced lunch, because we think that that is a indicator, really, of poverty. Um, it, um, actually, I'm sorry, it was a 30% increase for students that have free and reduced lunch. And if a certain number of your students if you had 75% of your students were on free and reduced lunch, you got another bump up because that means the community as a whole is a little more um, on the lower socioeconomic scale than others. Um, we looked at um, the top 10 most poor cities or communities, they got another bump up. We looked at whether you were in an urban area, a city, you got another bump up for that. Um, we looked then, we had to weigh the equalized grand list of the town versus the median income of the town. 70% uh, was weighted for the equalized grand list and 30% was looked at the median income. And then uh, we also looked at 
how we fund special education, which is a huge cost driver uh, for local boards um, of education and then for all of us that pay property taxes. Um, and we came up with a sliding scale so that each town right now has to wait until a student costs four and a half times the average cost to be reimbursed. And that's a huge outlay of costs for the town. So we looked at having a sliding scale so that um, <coughs> towns could get paid and reimbursed as they go. They don't have to wait. They are given a certain amount based on the population from last year. And as they um, experience higher costs, they are reimbursed immediately, which really will take a lot of the burden off of um, the local municipalities and how they try to manage the money for special education, in particular for Groton, because we have such a transient population here that we never know who's going to be coming in and who's going to be leaving with the military. The military also allows you to stay in Groton if you have a special needs student because we provide such wonderful um, services. Um, Groton, I wanted to say I have been uh, pushing for increased pilot funding for Groton because of our non-taxable status on many of our properties here and the fact that we have so many military students and one of the things that I have reiterated over and over is we might have an elementary school that has 400 students at the beginning of the year we have 400 students at the end of the year, but those kids have switched over three times sometimes. So it's three times the supplies. You're bringing kids in from other parts of uh, the United States. Maybe I'm going to pick on the southern states. I can do that because my daughter lives there. Someplace in Tennessee that maybe the educational standards are not as high as here, so then they need special help getting up to speed where they are in their classroom. So I wanted us really to be considered an outlier because we don't fit no matter what the uh, the formula is. We're very unique in that way. We really are a mini little city, um, although everybody in Hartford thinks we get this big check from the federal government with a big blue bow on it to pay for all of our students. And um, they're shocked to hear that doesn't happen. So it's been a very interesting educational um, time to try to educate legislators on how important it is to fund Groton properly. Uh, we have a military base that we want it to maintain its military value. Uh, when you reduce the funding for military students to go to the school, that reduces its military value. We know we're going to have another BRAC. We want to make sure our military value stays as high as it possibly can. Uh, because every time you erode that in any way, shape, or form, we put ourselves at risk. We've already been on the BRAC twice. Last time we were able to get off because we had a congressman that had a very good relationship with the Florida, uh, sorry, the Virginia delegation. We don't have that luxury anymore and we were very far down the road in the second round and if we're on the third time, we don't even want to be considered to be on the third time, especially when we're looking at, you know, what the cuts are from the governor and from some of the other parties, what they want to cut Groton. Uh, that will put us in a very, very difficult position. So that's one of the things that is my main focus because the submarine base is not only vital to Groton, but it's six billion dollars to the state of Connecticut's economy. So when you look at the map of what money is coming from what areas that is driven by the submarine base, I remind people in the northwest corner how much money that they, they are you know, getting from the fact that our military base is here. So that's been a bit, big educational uh, assault, I'll say, on the, on the legislators on how important um, a military base is. Um, some of the other things that we do is we, um, I was very, very adamant that we fund those who are most vulnerable the way they should be. So all of those who have intellectual disabilities, um, all our mental health boards, all our regional action councils, our school-based health clinics, our youth bureaus, those are all things that are so effective. Um, for example, a school-based health clinic is one of the most efficient ways to deliver health care especially to those who are most need. It's actually in the school. The students can go there. The parents can go there. If there's insurance, they bill for it. Those are all things that were absolutely eviscerated in everybody else's budget except for ours. We added that back in. Um, one of the things that, for me, is um, something that is absolutely government's role is those who are severely disabled, especially if you have a child, let's say, that's um, 19 and severely disabled, has gone through the school system. We've put all the special education money in that particular student, and now there's this age out period between 
the time they're 19 and 21 but when they become Medicaid um, eligible. Uh, the governor and every other caucus has said we are not going to pay for day services for these people, which means if you had someone like that in your family, you'd have to probably quit your job and stay home with that person and take care of them. Right now, we provide day services, so if you're in that situation, um, those students or young people can come together in a safe community, spend the day so their parents can work. Um, and that's something that we feel very strongly um, on in our caucus, so we have funded that fully because we feel that um, that's one of government's roles, to provide for those who cannot care for themselves. Um, we looked at things like trying to come up with um, a way to help those who have been here uh, that are retired. So we were able to, in our budget, offer a um, no tax on Social Security if you are a couple making $100,000 or less or if you are single making $75,000 or less. We also have a um, phase in for pensions where over 10 years we will phase out the tax on your pension, uh, which is something that we need to do to invite people to want to stay here in Connecticut. Uh, we wanted to do it over five years, but we just could not make the numbers work, so we had to spread it out over 10 years. Um, we do not increase the tax on cigarettes. We do not increase the tax on pistol permits. Um, we have a property tax credit that the governor has taken completely out, as have all the other caucuses. It's, it's only a $200 property tax credit. Um, it's a credit that you can take off of your uh, filing when you file your state income tax. But we were able to save it for those who have children and those who are retired. Um, we were not able to save that for everyone, um, but for as many as we could, we were able to do that. Um, we also do not tax hospitals. There's a big um, push to tax your hospitals um, and generate property tax for hospitals. But what is failed to um, be told is that hospitals right now already pay this exorbitant gross receipts tax. And the way that the gross receipts tax is supposed to work is that you pay um, tax on your gross receipts as a hospital, and the state takes that and gets a federal match, and some of that match comes back to the hospital to help pay for those that don't pay for themselves, Medicaid patients, TRICARE patients, um, to help offset that cost. But what has happened over the few years that we've had the gross receipts tax is that the hospitals pay in, the state gets the federal match, and then nothing comes back to the hospital. So that's something that's looked at now as actually, um, <clears throat> there's a case right now to find out if that's actually even legal. Um, so an example would be, I'll pick on Lawrence Hospital. Last year they paid $18 million in gross receipts tax and they got back $2 million. So they paid $661 million, all the hospitals, into the gross receipts tax, and the total return was less than $50 million. So, you know, this is this, group, this bunch of money that's supposed to be getting a federal match and then being returned to the hospitals to offset the cost, and it's not. So we're doing that to them, and now we want to charge them property tax on top of it. Um, so we do not charge property tax. It's something that we're very much against. Um, we also look at restoring things like Meals on Wheels will be restored, um, health, health clinics, the rape crisis centers, um, family resource centers, um, the mental regional health boards, I talked about that. Those are organizations that they get a little bit of funding from the state and then they get a federal match and they do wonders. They are um, in the hospitals, they're really in many cases the only mental health that, that some people have any kind of accessibility to. Um, it's very low dollars when you look at it, but when they, if they don't get the dollars from the state, they can't get the federal match and then they will dissolve. And they really are amazing people that do wonderful work on really a, a shoestring budget. Um, they also looked at wanting to reduce the burial benefits for veterans and we said no, we're not going to do that, so we restored that. Um, let me look at other things. We also restored the funding for the headstones for veterans. That was something that <clears throat> many caucuses wanted to eliminate, which we felt was absolutely not okay with us. Um, 
And tourism, we looked at tourism, and one of the things that we thought was very important is to fund tourism, because for every dollar you spend on tourism uh, in marketing, you get $3 back. Um, the, the governor of New York um, made a deal with the Tourism Bureau of New York and incentivized them and said, okay, if I give you this amount and you can do this in the return, then I'll give you more next year. And that happened. I think New York, and, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I want to say um, the year before they were given $25 million, but they returned 75. So this year he's giving them 50 to see what they can do um, in, in returns to uh, the state's economy. And for us here in this region, it's very important because we're the number one tourist generator um, anywhere in the state. So what we did um, is we asked that um, we have the highest hotel tax in the United States. So out of that 15%, we asked that 1.5% um, be put in a special t t pool for tourism. And we will then take that and divvy it out to things like the aquarium, the seaport. Instead of having them have a line item in the budget, because it's so easy then to just cross that out, um, in this way, as they generate more tourism, more money would go into this fund, and we would be able to um, generate more and more tourism. I know that Rita is heavily involved in tourism, has been for years. Um, the other thing is part of the casino deal for the third casino is um, a certain percentage off of the slot machines will go into the tourism uh, pool also. So we should have, at the end of the year, if this budget passes, it's not what we need, but we should have close to $15 million to be able to spend um, in tourism. And again, we are competing against New York, Massachusetts, all these other places where people want to spend uh, their vacations or come to visit. And you know, other states are spending 25 million or 50 million. You, I'm sure you've seen on TV the commercials come to New York or come to California or come wherever. Um, and we don't really have any of that here in Connecticut. So, um, and tourism is one of the key industries that's been identified by our Economic Competitiveness Commission, which I sit on, uh, we look at the, the five big sectors for Connecticut, and tourism is way up there. So obviously, we have to fund it to grow it. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. And those are the highlights. Um, we will be in our budget again. Um, providing funding for the fire training schools. We have fire training schools that our firemen cannot be trained because we have not funded the uh, schools properly. Um, we will be reimbursing small towns for 85% of resident troopers. The governor has come up with an idea to just eliminate all of that. So these small towns, and I have many of them up north, that can't afford to have a police <clears throat> department or don't need one, so to speak, if they have a resident trooper, um, that was all going to be on on the town's back to be able to pay for that, and they're very expensive. So towns were looking, I know like the town of Griswold was looking at um, maybe doing something with the town of Plainfield to see if they could hire some of their policemen at different times to cover Griswold, um, but we will have the availability now to have some of those towns reimbursed um, for, um, for their resident troopers. One of the biggest things for me is that we fully funded the um, chief medical examiner's office. I don't know if you're aware of this, but our chief medical examiner's office was lost its accreditation, which means if you have some kind of case, uh, you can't prove it because your chief medical examiner's office is not accredited anymore. Um, it is so bad that um, we had 900 overdoses last year, and we didn't have enough refrigeration. So I'll just put it bluntly. That's the state that we're in. Um, they have to hire another pathologist. They have to um, get the refrigeration up in order. Um, they need to be able to have this accredited so that when you have prosecutors that are prosecuting crimes, if a medical examiner testifies that it's considered an accredited facility, um, it's shocking to me that that would not be something that would be funded. Um, let's see what else. We eliminate public financing, campaign financing. Um, public financing um, happened when Governor Rell was the governor, and this was a program that was established to try to uh, have campaigns and being running and running for office be an equal playing field, so that anybody could run for office. You didn't have to. 
um, be someone that was well connected or someone that you maybe could self fund for your campaign and the idea was great so you had to go out and you raised money and you couldn't take from anybody who had a state contract and your <clears throat> dollar values were small a hundred dollars or less and you had to get a certain amount of people to donate to you and raise a certain amount of money and then you were matched by the state they gave you a grant to run and the idea was you would be on the equal playing field as whoever you were running against so it was fair but what's happened is that um, there has been, and this was all going to be funded, the grant was going to be funded by selling off excess land or property that the state had. What's happened, and we saw it in 2014, when um, certain individuals ran for office, what they did is they found a loophole. So instead of everybody having, let's say it's $50,000 to run, um, that person had $50,000 to run, but they raised all this money and they sent it to their state party. And then their state party was able to fund their campaign. So we had one state senate case, or state senate race, I should say, where um, the individual raised another $300,000 above and beyond what they were given in the grant. So the idea of a fair playing field doesn't exist. It's kind of like the unicorn healthcare. So either you have it and it's fair, or you don't and it's not. So for us, um, we said we should just eliminate it. I would be perfectly fine if you eliminate it and you keep the dollar values low and you can't take from contractors, but that everybody has the ability to raise their own money uh, because this idea of the state contributing to campaigns, number one, they contribute to campaigns when you have no opponent. You get less money, but you still get money. And then when people can break the rules, or they're not really breaking the rules, but they're finding loopholes um, where they're kind of raising their own money anyway. And plus, this particular um, account is going to be um, about $30 million in the hole. So um, there's not enough land to sell off to have this be self-fulfilling. So one of the things we said is we want to eliminate this because it's not working. So we might as well um, eliminate it and save the taxpayers a lot of money. Um, some of the long-term structural changes, this is not a full list, but I just want to give you a few highlights um, that would require the legislature to vote on all union contracts. Um, in the past, they have chosen not to. So a union contract comes due or is negotiated and it comes nothing then it goes in after 30 days um, so we're gonna say the legislature has to vote on this yes or no and um, we would like to have a constitutional spending cap we would like a lockbox with only one person having the key for transportation um, we would like to um, encourage the brownfield redevelopment we got that bill passed um, we want to remove barriers to regionalization um, so that if towns decide they want to share services, uh, they can do that in an easier manner. Um, it's tough in Connecticut. We have 169 towns and everybody wants their own stuff. We're very territorial. It's very New England. Um, but if you want to be able to um, share services, we want to make that easier for towns to be able to do. Um, and that's something that we um, want to remove whatever barriers they are to that. Um, we would like to create, it failed, but a citizen in need account, which is something that, let's say that you um, want to give $10,000 because you're very wealthy to an organization in need. We want to have you be able to do that and to take a larger deduction off of your um, state income tax. So therefore, we can help fund <clears throat> some of our social services in a way that other states do and giving the person who donates it more of an incentive to do that um, than what we have now. Um, there was a bill in to be able to do that for up to $10,000. So if you're somebody who <clears throat> you know, paid the state of Connecticut X amount, if you donate $10,000 to whatever organization, you would get more of a credit uh, than you would um, just paying for um, the state of Connecticut and therefore we figure that that money will go to good use to those who are most in need um, requiring UConn Health Center again to seek a private partnership 
and really competitively bidding the managed care of the Department of Corrections. All of those things together, um, plus what we, whatever we see out of this um, potential negotiation with the governor and the state employees union, together without tax increases, we can actually uh, balance this budget and put us structurally in the right position or moving the needle a little bit so that we can um, go in the right direction. Um, I've spent a, quite a long time on this um, economic competitiveness committee. We had a landscape of Connecticut done by a group called McKinsey out of Stanford, which does economic studies for countries. And their number one, um, I guess, word of advice, and all I have heard repeatedly from every business that I have visited throughout Connecticut is, Businesses create jobs, they're employers, they are really the heartbeat of your state. Without businesses, no one has a place to work. Um, we can't demonize them. We need to help them want to be here. We need to do what we can economically to make them want to be here. We do have the most expensive things like electricity, workman's comp, um, insurance, all those things are very, very expensive here in Connecticut. And the cost of labor is expensive here in Connecticut. So what can we do creatively to make people want to come here? Um, we have to think of them as partners, I believe, rather than adversaries or you know these big bad corporations. Uh, because without them, there's no place for any of us to work. And that's just sort of the re reality of where we are. Um, when we saw Aetna leave this year, I thought that would be a big wake-up call for people. But instead, I heard, oh, well, it's only the executives that are leaving. There's still, you know, there's still 5,000 people here working for Aetna. And my thought is, for how long? How long? I always say, you know, God or whatever, he taps you on the shoulder, but sometimes he has to hit you in the head with a brick for you to realize things. And I think that brick has hit all of us, most of us. Um, but without making really difficult decisions, um, I don't think that we're going to move ourselves in the right direction. So we need the support from our citizens to help us, empower us to make those, you know, those correct decisions to move us on the right path. And none of us that are up there want to um, tell somebody they don't have a job or ask somebody to give something more than they're giving now. But we're in a, we're in a position where we have to uh, because there, it, we just simply don't have enough money. There's not enough money to go around. And, you know, I had a conversation with somebody who's in the state employee union, and um, they said to me, we've already given back. We're not going to give any more. And I understand that. You were promised something, and now you're not potentially going to get that. But my was promised when I grew up here that myself and my children would be able to live here, and they would be able to have an opportunity to stay here. Uh, my parents were promised that they would be able to retire here. And all of that has gone away. And I'm saying to, I said to someone, I am forced to cut all the day services some, for somebody who's intellectually disabled, who maybe can't feed themselves, or for somebody who is in a mental health, health crisis that's going to end up in our ER every other day. And I'm asking you to look at increasing your copay. For somebody like me who had an emergency appendectomy that cost $35, you know, look at it in that perspective. I'm not trying to take anything away from you, but we're in a position where if we don't change, we will have thousands and thousands of layoffs because there is no money. There's, it's just not here. And every day, it's getting worse and worse as 500 people leave. And it's not an enviable position to be in, but that's the reality of it. And everyone might tell you, oh, it's fine, we can do this, we can just raise taxes. We can't raise enough taxes to pay for this. It just can't happen. Um, so that's what we're faced with. That's the reality of it. Um, nobody's happy about it. Um, but I'm not somebody who wants to put my head in the sand. I want to uh, look at the reality of where we are and we try to move the needle in the direction so that those who are retired or those who are young have a future here and that they can raise families and they can potentially have a job here in Connecticut. I don't want to see Connecticut become Detroit. And if unless we make these difficult decisions, that's where we're headed. So I'm sure that's not what everyone wanted to hear, but that's that's the truth. So, <laughs> so yes, ma'am. Lori. Um, because we're going to be seeing each other a lot. 
Uh, Sorry, a couple I things. You enlighten me at the breakfast about the uh, concessions that the CBAC mm -hmm. shouldn't approve. Where did that go? Um, the CBAC vote, I think, was today, actually. I'm not sure if everybody voted or everybody didn't. I've Can been. Can you let us know how that works? I will. Um, the way it works is um, each individual bargaining unit has to vote on whether they accept the negotiations or they don't on the healthcare side and the pensions on the pension side and the um, current side. And then out of all the different bargaining units, 75 percent of them have to agree that they want to vote on it and then they can vote on it and it's yes or no. Some of the bargaining units I've been told are not interested in voting on it, meaning they're not interested in um, voting yes or no. Um, the concessions, we can talk about the concessions quickly. Um, there's the concessions or the changes. I, I hate the word concessions. The changes in the CBAC agreement. There's the one column which is the state contract. That's what you're locked in contractually. And then there's another column over here that can be done legislatively. The proposed changes um, that have been offered by the governor um, to open up this contract and to extend the contract for an additional four years, which no one can get laid off, no one, there'll be no changes. Um, for that four years, the savings, if you crunch the numbers, really are $186 million. He talks about $700 million. Well, the other $500 plus is coming from this column over here in which you don't have to open up the contract. So our caucus looked at it f strictly financially and said, why would we open up a contract and extend it for four years when we're only getting $186 million of concessions? It's not enough. We should be able to do all of that over here in this column where we can legislatively make changes and not extend the contract. So that's kind of where we are. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the contract. I don't know all the specifics of what the governor has negotiated. But, you know, within some of the contracts that I've looked at, there might be zero increases, but there's steps. So there really is an increase. Um, you know, things like con contribution to your pension, to your health care system, to changing the deductible, all those things can be done over here in this column. They don't, you don't have to open up a contract to be able to do that. So um, I'm sure that there will be debate if, if the unions decide to vote that they will accept whatever the uh, arrangement is that the governor has made, um, that vote will come to the legislature. And again, normally the legislature does not vote on it. Um, I can tell you that I know my caucus will vote on it. And we'll have to see what the deal is. And if we think it makes sense for the citizens of Connecticut, we will vote yes. And if we don't, then we will vote no. Um, again, my caucus is not the majority. So I don't know how everything will shake out. But um, I think now we have to look at it purely on a non-emotional basis. And what are the changes that we're going to make that will help Connecticut as a whole uh, moving forward? And there's many things that you can do in this column without opening up a contract or breaking it. Um, the legislature just has never had the wherewithal to do it. Um, and some of the contracts that, I'll give you this one, Pen legislators like me. Not me, because I just started. But there are some legislators that have been there for a long, very long time. And um, the state does not reimburse us for mileage because we drive all over the place, but they do reimburse you if you go to the Capitol. So if you go to the Capitol, you know, you have to log in what you're doing that day, what your committee meeting is, and you get reimbursed for your mileage to the Capitol. There are legislators that have had the same amount of mileage every year for the past 10 years. So they guess they've gone to the Capitol on those exact days every year for the past 10 years. And if they're reimbursed, let's just say it's $10,000, because it has been in many cases, in travel expense, that is actually added to their pension. And then they get paid on that. I'm not kidding. No. So I keep thinking, I traveled overseas for 17 years, one week a month for my company. I can't imagine getting reimbursed for travel and then adding that to a pension which I didn't have or a 401k which we finally got up and running like three years before I left. You know, it's just, so those are the types of things that have been ingrained for a very long time. There are other contracts where um, 
you know, our leader shared with us that if you had a uniform and you had it dry cleaned and you got reimbursed for your dry cleaning, the dry cleaning is added to your pension. So, I mean, it just goes on and on. And you, you, you kind of say, you know, this is not the employees. I mean, that's a great thing for the employee. I would have voted yes, that's awesome. But whoever looked at these contracts years ago or approved these or didn't look at them, really, that's what we're paying for now. And I just want to stress, there are so many great state employees. I was just with one today who operates the bridge in Mystic. And they are hardworking, and they are dedicated, and they get it. They understand where we are. It's, it's breaking through that leadership at the top that's the tif difficult time, you know, the difficult part. And, um, you know, I don't know how many state employees I've talked to that said, I'm absolutely willing to pay more towards my health care. I get it. I get that I have a great deal. I'm OK paying more from a copay. Actually, one person said to me, I'm actually embarrassed when I go to CVS and I'm getting all this stuff and they're like, that's $10 versus like the little old lady who comes in and is writing out a huge check. You know, they, I, so they're willing to do it. It's just getting to that level and um, that, that's one of the most difficult parts. Yes, sir. Hi. I live in a small town around here mm -hmm. and, um, and I was, uh, served on the Economic Devel Development Commission came to see that we have a lot of redundancy. We have 169 towns. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking of a way to make that change over time. And, uh, and I think recently I thought of a, a good thought, which is that, you know, it's great that you said you restored some funding to things in local towns. But in some senses, I think that enables our system. We're kind of like a drug dealer feeding the, feeding the junkie. Um, I think it'd be a great idea if over time, if we gave the towns, towns below a certain population size, a heads up, hey, after 2019, your share of, your know, revenue sharing is gonna be cut to this percentage, and in 2001, it's gonna be, 2021, it's gonna be cut to this percentage. Mm -hmm. At some point, it's gonna be eliminated. You guys have to think about merging services. We're not just gonna take away barriers, we're going to incentivize and, and, and punish you for continuing to drain us for the support of you know, a tax collector in every town and the tax assessor in every town and a superintendent, particularly for you know, towns like Salem that don't have a high school and, and, and Norwich that doesn't have a high school, technically. Um, isn't that where most of the money is really being spent? Aren't we spending fortunes on supporting every little municipality? You know, it's funny that you say that because uh, we really don't. We s most of that money is through the education side. I so I, I mean, we're 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 spending, we're paying property tax to support those guys. Your local towns, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So that effort, really, for me, would have to come from the towns. I don't. You know, I I think the the towns would have to decide. I mean, we're in Groton. We can't get a city and a town together. Yeah, you know, right. a city in the, t in the town together. So I think that has to. Sorry, that's where I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think you can take the lead because if you cut the funding off and give them a heads up so they have enough mm -hmm. time to organize themselves, they have no choice. At some point, they have to. Well, merge. we, you know, in some respect, um, I'll talk about the education funding, which is the biggest portion for every town that gets from the state level. Um, what you're saying is somewhat true. Many towns have had a decli uh, declining enrollment of, in some cases, up to 20% but their funding for education has never been cut because nobody's wanted to cut anybody for education. When you have a new formula, you're, this is based on enrollment and who you have in your current education system and it's recalculated every year. So you're doing that um, as opposed to, okay, I know you've had 20% declining enrollment, but I'm just going to keep you where you are. Um, the thing is, most towns can't respond quick enough to that type of um, significant change. So in our plan, if you are a town that has been reduced significantly, it's phased in so that you can you have an opportunity uh, to respond. And on the flip side, if you're a town that has been underfunded, which we have many of those around here uh, because they haven't you know, had the representation to fight for them, um, that would also be phased in. So you're not gonna get this big windfall and you're not going to also be faced with a, I'm just gonna make something up, a $5 million reduction that would be phased in over 10 years. Um, there's other 
um, caucuses that want to phase it in over seven years or over five years, but there is a phase in. Um, the other thing I should mention is that our budget will not accept the teachers' pensions being pushed down to the town. Um, that is something that was negotiated by the State Board of Education and um, not the towns. And therefore, um, the, the state actually, again, years ago, was not funding properly the pensions for the teachers. The teachers do pay in. There's a misconception that they don't. Um, people also want to blend the teachers with the state employees union. They're separate, just so everyone knows. Teachers are not, they do not collect Social Security. Even if they work another job, they are not allowed to uh, collect Social Security. They do pay in. And years ago, the state did not save for their pensions, and they took out a big bond to pay for that. And now the bond payment is due, and that's the state's responsibility, and they're trying to pass that down to the towns. So that's something that our caucus feels adamantly that it's the state's responsibility, and they have to figure out how to fund that properly. So, um, so we'll, you know, again, this is our budget. I'm not sure what's going to turn out in the end, but uh, we will we'll see how, how things progress along. Um, yes, ma'am. Well, again, that's all fluid right now because you have uh, four different caucuses with four different ideas on how to fund education. Uh, the governor's proposal is not welcomed by anyone. Um, basically, that was going to reduce Groton's budget by $14 million, and um, New London was going to get an extra $10 million. So you saw this sort of redistribution between um, cities and uh, other areas. Um, I think under his proposal, um, I think Hartford got an additional $47 million, and Waterbury got like a $38 million increase. Um, that, from all caucuses, is a dead on arrival proposal. Um, so you have a Democrat uh, potential, a Democrat Senate potential formula, which I saw, um, which is okay for Groton. It's not great. I don't agree with the formula. Um, but at least it's something. I like our formula the best because I think it's the most fair. Um, and then there is a House Republican uh, potential for education, which does nothing. It doesn't change anything next year, which for me is not a good message. We've already been told by a judge that we're not educating properly or fairly. So I think if we have this formula that's not working, that's been politicized, we need to change it. Um, so theirs really doesn't change it. Um, and then the Democrat House proposal that I saw briefly, now they have not put out a line by line item budget that I've seen yet. Um, that destroys Groton. It, it was a $18 million reduction. Um, no, that one's still alive. That one's still alive. That's a Democrat House proposal, the last one I saw. Um, so that's, that's a problem. So, again, a lot of it is in education. Um, when I talked with the woman who, I met with the um, woman who is working on the Democrat Senate education formula. And one of the things that she had sent to me was, there's this misconception in OPM or the Office of Fiscal Analysis, and they're supposed to be neutral, but they're not. Um, that Groton gets this big check from the federal government with a red bow for all the education. They think that we're wealthy. They think that everybody lives in Groton Long Point and that in, they don't understand how diverse Groton is. And um, I reminded her that we have a president who just proposed all federal impact aid to be zeroed out. So we might get federal impact aid, and we do, but it's four years in the making. Um, it's $3 million. Um, and if you look at what the cost is to educate military folks here, it's like $19 million. So we get $3 million out of $19 million. Um, it's not this big windfall. They, there's a misconception of, of that. They think we get this pilot money from the federal government to pay for all this stuff, and um, that's just not accurate. It's not true. So I was able to get the data showing, <coughs> look, here's what it is, because it has to be, for me, data-driven, and be able to pass that along to her. Um, there's also, they don't understand if you have a special needs child, and I got the data for Groton, and we have, it's not to pick on anybody, but we have, you know, military special needs that sometimes it will cost close to $300,000 for one student, and we're getting no tax dollars for that student 
and yes, we're really happy that the military is here. And my argument has been, we all in the state of Connecticut should be really happy we have the military here. It's a great thing for our economy. It's a great thing for our nation. But it can't be on the backs of just rotten taxpayers. It has to, all of us have to contribute to that. And so that's been my argument there. So nobody knows what's going to happen with, with the, um, these different formulas, because there's a lot going around. I will say that ours is close to the Democrat Senate's formula. Um, one of the differences is how much money do you put in the pool of education? We put close to $70 million more in the pool of education than they do. So that's one of the differences also. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Could you please be so kind to clarify a misconception and confusion in this very question and statement? Because a couple months ago, when the budget and the taxes were all being reevaluated, and before we got hit with what we did, mm -hmm. I had gone to the town, Rotten Town Hall. One of the employees there, who is quite prominent, explained to me that where we need to start is with the duplication. So now I'm a little confused because I agree with what this gentleman is saying. And I was also told by the, a longtime town employee that we need to start with duplication between the city, Groton Long Point, and Groton. So can you clarify what this big misconception is, please. I don't know if it's a misconception, but um, we have the town of Groton, and then within it you have two separate boroughs that have legislative authority that was enacted under the legislation, under the legislature years ago. You have the city of Groton, and you have Groton Long Point. Each one of them has taxing authority, um, and each one of them cannot be um, dissolved unless it comes from within that organization. So the city itself would have to get together and decide that they want to, I don't know, either become part of the town officially or they want to break away from the town. They would have to vote through a referendum and then it would have to be approved by the legislature to have that happen. That's the same thing in Grant Long Point. One thing that I um, want to clarify and is that you have the town of Groton let's just pick, let's talk about police so you have the town of Groton police and you have a police chief you have the city of Groton police and you have a police chief but if you live in the city like I do we pay an extra close to six mils for that additional service so that is not coming from the town's coffers if that makes any sense You know, we have tried as a town and a city to sit together to look at where we can, um, I'll say, share services. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that um, the city itself, clearly, as well as Grant Long Point, they want to have a separate taxing authority. They want to be separate. So I think that we have to look at it differently. And we have to look at, as a town, instead of saying the town is the one that knows how to do this the best, maybe we should look at saying, I'm just going to make something up. The city is awesome at doing sidewalks. Maybe this, we should talk to the city and say, can you do all the sidewalks for the town and share services that way? But there has been, <clears throat> unfortunately, this, I'll say, a very difficult uh, relationship between the city and the town. Um, between the uh, folks that are elected officials and um, sometimes with Groton Long Point. But for an example, the town gives Groton Long Point, and I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm going to say close to $250,000 a year for police and roads. I think that's right. I don't know if my numbers are right. It's been quite a few years since I've <clears throat> been on the council. Is that about right? I don't know. Okay. If we looked at what it would cost the town to police Groton Long Point, in their high volume in the summer when there's like 5,000 people there. And it would cost the town more to hire the patrolmen to have to do the patrol than it is to just write Grant Long Point a check. And Grant Long Point, again, their, their area has um, special dues that they pay to pay for those extra services. So 
on the outside, it might seem like there's all these areas that you're going to save money in, but I think we'd have to uh, be able to just sit down and have a conversation on, instead of um, consolidating, on sharing services rather than consolidating. Because I don't necessarily think, number one, it's ever going to happen, but number two, um, I'm not sure how much money you save. You'd have to really do the analysis to look at it. Because They've tried, but if you don't have the, the will from each party, it makes it more difficult because you're really pull, trying to pull information out of them. Um, so I'm not, I would say that we haven't had a really fair evaluation on how services are, are delivered. And the services in the city um, may be different than what they are in the town, and the people are paying extra for that. So it's tricky. Sure. On the state or the town? Uh, both. I can't speak to the town because I'm out of the town. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not okay, involved so you can in only that. Speak, speak to the town, state level. Well, I, you know, I I'm not going to meddle in the town on what's going on as far as like who's talking to who. I think um, I think that um, there should be a consolidated effort to try to work together. I do, and I think it could oh, be oh, done. Um, uh, right. And I think that I think I see a, a concerted effort to work together on the committee levels, on all the committee levels, on environment, not so much in higher education, but um, education or even in um, appropriations. When I was in the appropriations in our subcommittee for health and human services, <clears throat> maybe that's just an easier thing to do. But most of us were all on the same page, whether we we're independent, Republican, Democrat, we all felt that these particular things are really important. And we all said, yes, we can't do this. We're going to push this to the private sector. There's a little pushback here. But most of us, when we got together, we're on the same page. We understand it. Um, and then it gets higher and higher. And then all of us that are the individual reps or the individual senators are sort of left out of that conversation. And it's left to leaders to, to mash that all out. Um, so that's where we are. But I do think that um, the town could have a consolidated effort to try to work together. And I think we're doing that in certain areas. Um, but I just think um, it, it ta it, it's not quick. It has to be. Well, we can't yeah. stand for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's why we're all spending money mm -hmm. doing this. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice evening. Yes, you too. Will we be doing this again? We can do it as often as people want to hear me talk. Yep. If I would call um, the speaker, Erisimowitz, and I would call Martin Looney. Those are the two people that have to sign off to have a budget heard. Yes. Any budget. Any budget. It could be any budget. Uh, because if anybody puts out a budget, anyone can put an amendment to amend it so that it's their budget. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, yeah, that's where we are. Those are the two people. Everyone else is ready to have a budget be heard. So, um, what are they waiting for? I don't know. You can't get their own clock. I think that's part of it. You know, I can't. You know, I, I do think that the especially the House. There's so many people. There's uh, 151 people. There's a lot of different um, interests. There's different spectrums of uh, philosophies. You have um, individuals that um, are. You know, very, very, very left. You have others that are very, very, very right. You have those that are um, representing cities. You have um, others that are somewhere in the middle. Um, you have certain folks that um, might be focused on one particular thing, that that's their thing. Um, so it's, it's hard to corral all those different interests and to try to come to some consensus. That would be what I would feel if I were the speaker. Um, but at some point, you have to be able to put something out there and be able to have it debated. I'm not saying that, you know, I think we have the best budget. That's great for the citizens of Connecticut. But I'm willing, and we have been willing, we tried to get it here, heard before the legislative session was over. We'll put it out there. Tell us what you don't like. Amend it. Put other suggestions out there. We're ready to have a conversation. Um, but it never happened. So I don't know if it's that they don't have their budget ready. I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. So when they bring forth a budget, sign off and bring up for a budget, you or the, or the Republican House can mm -hmm. put your budgets in as amendments? Yes. And then again. Every, then everything's out there? Yes, you, d you could put it in as amendment. But again, you have to have the numbers to pass that amendment. 
So what's happening right now uh, is that there's negotiation between um, you know, some of the, le the leaders, maybe it's the Democrat Senate leader and the Republican Senate leader, because a lot of our stuff is fairly close to, to where we are. Um, they might want a tax increase where we don't want a tax increase. Um, you know, their budget, their formula might be different for um, how they're going to pay for education than ours. But at least we're having conversations. Um, the House and the Senate, I think, are not talking to each other at this point really in a way that we would want them to. They're probably talking, but not in, I want all those leaders in a room every single day, hashing it out until they come out with a plan. That's what I want, but we're not seeing that yet. So um, so we'll see. One of my friends was a legislator um, when they brought in the income tax, and he had shared with me, it reminded him of what it was like then, but he said the difference was then, every single day, the leaders met every day. So they were having you know, conversations on, um, you know, negotiations on, you know, and he said, it's pretty easy. You write down the six things that you can't live with. They write down the six things they can't live with, and you put it all together, and you, you try to come up with, you know, some kind of negotiation. So that's where we are. Um, we do have um, quite a few um, more, I would say, more financially conservative um, members or representatives from the Democratic Party that have come over and they have um, sat with us and gone over our budget line item by line item. Um, so for me, it's, only, it's, not really a, it's not really a party thing. It's... Uh, you guys get along. I said that at the beginning. I, watching TV, you think there's a big screaming match going on. Yeah. I think most of us get along, you know, as far as, you know, the worker bees, you know, and then, you know, philosophically, we might be different in certain areas, but um, I, I think we can certainly have a conversation. You know, I- Democrats talk away too, you mean the moderates or the- Yes, so you have fractions within all of the different, you know, organizations. I, I, I don't know whether the House Dems are talking to the House Senate. I, I don't know. I know that the, um, the Democratic Senate was very disappointed that um, the speaker would not allow the mini budget to be heard. <clears throat> um, the mini budget was a budget that was crafted so that in this time period where we don't have a formalized budget, you had enough operating uh, revenue so that you could not defund all the social services or not defund things that are critical to people. Um, <clears throat> but he would not allow that to be heard. So to me, it's amazing that one person can hold everything up. It is one person, not the caucus. It's one person. Yes, so um, maybe the caucus voted, but I, you know, it, most people wanted a mini budget to be heard, to be debated, um, so that we would have still a functioning government on some respect until we can um, get everybody together. Um, and, the, and the governor, rightly so, came out with a really um, draconian way to fund things because I think probably for his perspective, he said you guys get together and get this done. And he wanted a mini budget. And, uh, and so right now we're left with um, really important organizations being completely defunded, which is very, very uh, difficult. On TV or shows a, the Republican, whether it's House or Senate, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> as you just said, with the uh, union contract just going off. Mm -hmm get the word they use offline and they're saying there's legal problems with that is there no they always say that you know there's no legal problem that you can't resolve as far as i'm concerned okay. you know um but there's certain things that have never been done before <clears throat> so you're going to get a lot of pushback like oh you can't do that it's never been done before um so um you know perhaps there is but not that we're aware of and we've had certain legal advice and looking at what we can do. It just may not, not have been done before. Um, and that's a go-to, I think, for people that are, oh, you can't do that, it's illegal. So, and then every, you know, the headlines are, you know, they wanna do illegal things. The other thing that's really difficult in this budget time, as you can imagine, is you think of the headlines. I remember one of them was, Malloy says Senate GOP healthcare budget decimates this, this, and this. And he's not talking about our budget, he's talking about the federal budget. But people are really confused as far as what budget are you talking about, you know, what GOP. So not only do you have the confusion of this budget, but you have the confusion of Washington on top of it. So there's layer upon layer of, you know, confusing headlines. My advice is always read the details because, and don't believe everything you read in the paper because 
half of it's not true or it's one-sided, but um, it was really interesting. I had a lot of phone calls. I'll just give you an example quickly. Uh, there was one bill that was to allow, it, the title of the bill said um, to allow bear hunting in Connecticut. But when you read the bill, it was really allowing the DEP to come up with a wildlife management plan for bears in the northwest corner of Connecticut because we've had so many issues with bears. There was a big incident at a Boy Scout camp last year, and someone is going to get hurt. It was for them to be able to go in and decide, should we have a bear hunting season, should we not, who's impacted, what's the population. Um, and it came out of environment, the environment committee, but with that title, it sounded like you wanted to go into somebody's little, you know, like kill the little baby cubs in their, in their den, and that's not at all what it is. And everybody got very upset, and my, my thought was, read the bill, read what's in the bill. I had another one, my bill, it, and we don't come up with the titles either. The attorneys that draft the legislation, you tell them your idea, you tell them what you want to do, they come up with the bill, and usually your first bill is sort of, it's not refined, it's at the 50,000 foot level, and over time it, it changes and gets morphed. And one of my bills was like, cost savings for Medicaid students. And really what this bill was, which is a great bill, um, it didn't get anywhere, but it's a good bill, was looking at um, the cost of college kids that are on Medicaid. We have, and you can probably appreciate this as a physician, for example, next year we expect to have 2,500 students at UConn on Medicaid. Medicaid costs the state of Connecticut let's say around $8,000 a student. There's a sliding scale because you do get some reimbursement from the federal government, but that changes over time. You're not always reimbursed at the higher rate. Over time, it comes down. Uh, and I'm looking at this going, you know what? We should just buy the college plan because it's $3,000. So we would save $5,000 per student. It's better coverage. It covers you if you travel overseas or you transfer to another school. The kicker is you have a copay if you don't go to the Infirmary, you have to pay $10 or $5 when you go to the doctor. But it's Blue Cross and Blue Shields. We know how hard it is to find a physician who will take Medicaid. Massachusetts did the same thing last year. I'm not reinventing the, the, the wheel. They saved $40 million. They hope next year they'll save $200 million. Um, I tried to bring this up in higher ed. I was told, you hate college kids. You just want them to pay more. And I'm like, no, you know, it's better health care. Yes, they have a copay, but ten dollars is a pizza or a couple beers. Come on, you know. A year to go to <laughs> so um, it didn't get anywhere. It just it died. It it died on a party line vote, probably because it's something that nobody had ever really thought about before. And ironically, after it it failed, um, there was a letter that came from Tom Price, the new health and Secretary of in Washington saying everybody should look at creative ways to try to do things differently with Medicaid, and um, us of course I wanted I brought that to show them, and uh, I had actually even talked to the insurance companies and said okay, what happens if we add this pool of 2,500 healthy young people, and they said oh you're going to watch that premium come down I can't tell you how much but probably 15 percent, so you know there's opportunities there to just look at things differently, um, to um, you know, just to change the way we do things, but there's a lot of um, pushback because it's not been done before. There's a lot of um, defensive reactions saying, look, Connecticut provides great Medicaid, and I'm not saying they don't, but we are in a situation where we have to look at every penny and how we allocate it and how we spend it. So we have to be able to have people that are sent there to have a creative, open mind to look at things differently. Maybe my idea would have not worked out, but it's definitely worth an opportunity of looking at it. And, um, and that's another difficult thing to overcome. Is we've always done it this way, and my response is, yes, and you're doing a stellar job. That's why we are where we are. So, um, so those are the types of things that you run into. But any other questions? I know it's late. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I me, appreciate that. You are the epitome of what a democracy slash republic <laughs> means. You know, Somebody you told me I was the best Democrat they had in Harvard. Yes. So but I, I, I chuckled. I'm the cat, so I don't mean to be rude. Oh, go. No, All nice right, to so, see you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. Well, if you're interested, um, I think we have some sheets on 
sort of the summary of, our, of what our budget does. I didn't print out the line item by line item because it's 73 pages long, but it is available on the Senate website if you want to go look at it. It says Senate budget line item by line item. You can see every line within the budget on you know what is their last year what's proposed. Um, it'll show you whether there's a reduction, um, but the summary will tell you sort of the 50,000 foot view of where we're interested in going, um, what we would like to see change, and I also have this, which is sort of an analysis of the um, the potential union contract that we've heard and what the savings is, and um, you're welcome to take copies of this. This is also on the website, so you can see for yourself um, um, what actually is what we're looking at in the future um, and what the options are um, to accept things or to not accept things. And they're also on the... Um, the website is the town runs. You can look at how our education impacts each individual town um, if you're interested in looking at that. But everything, I didn't print everything out because it's all there. I don't know if you want to print it out, but you can look at it um, if you're interested. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, uh, the budget process is sort of a, a, uh, a moving target and a, uh, you know, it's sort of a, uh, a process of hopefully negotiation so we can get to a good place for uh, the citizens of Connecticut. Um, I know I'm not willing to give up, um, and I hope you all are not either, because I think if we send the right people there and make the right choices, we can slowly return to a place where people want to stay, and um, and kids will, young people will have an opportunity here in Connecticut. Um, we also, I want to just throw a plug out. I was at Davis Standard today in southeastern Connecticut. Um, Although many people in the legislature think we're a bunch of hillbillies, which we're not, um, and they have sort of a misunderstanding of what happens when you cross the Connecticut River, um, I have to say, southeastern Connecticut is really becoming this little manufacturing hub that we're not seeing anywhere else in Connecticut between what's happening at Electric Boat, um, Davis Standard just opened today, a 15,000 square foot facility, a new facility. Um, they're looking to hire um, about 30 people. They're looking for, if anybody's watching, um, some advanced and um, experienced CNC machinists. Uh, they can't seem to find them. Um, so those are all really good things. And manufacturing um, is something that we focus on in education. Um, we're, we're working on an apprentice program so that someone who is in high school has an opportunity to be exposed to um, a different type of career um, that can get some credit, that can have the availability when they graduate high school, um, not only to have a high school diploma, but have some skills that they can go right to work. That's something that I'm a huge advocate of, and I'm going to continue to push for that. Um, it brings a little bit of a, a European model um, to the United States and um, really looks at valuing those types of jobs because they're good paying jobs with great potential. Um, and we have an aging workforce and nobody new to come in. Um, to fill those positions. So I thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody. My card's up there. I know I've met with many of you um, offline, but I'm happy to talk to you as we go further. And I promise I will come back when I have any new updates on the budget. I hope it's sooner than later. Um, and you'll see I have an op-ed in the day tomorrow talking about um, that it's time to have the legislators come home from their vacations and get back to work. Um, so, uh, to me, nobody should be on vacation until their work is done. So, um, it's time to get something done. So, I appreciate you coming out on this gorgeous night, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch. Feel free to call me if you need anything. Thanks.